Good afternoon, everyone. This is T3 Live Editor-in-Chief John Darcy here to bring you the daily recap. So we came in this morning. We highlighted a bunch of different setups in different sectors, but the theme of the morning call was expect the market to be quiet. Don't expect major range resolution ahead of the Fed. And it seems like that was the theme that you read everywhere, any financial publication or a lot of people on Twitter, a lot of people, uh, you know, they're in the trading education and analysis sphere. Uh, and maybe when that consensus gets so much that the market's going to do one thing, like be quiet ahead of the Fed, maybe that's a reason why it doesn't do that. And today we had a really nice move to the upside out of uh, the wedge pattern that we had been talking about. Uh, caught some people by surprise, but we highlighted a lot of really nice setups in off the charts and in today's morning call that could have worked out really well if you just, you know, were willing to put on trades rather than expect the market to do nothing at all. Uh, and, and we'll take a look at a few of those charts here in the daily recap to review some of the ideas that we've gone over in the community uh, over the last few days. But first, we'll take a look at chart of the SPY. You can see that wedge pattern from uh, the trend lines that we drew this morning. Uh, so we drew this upper trend line yesterday. It looked like we wanted to break out of it, but uh, that Financial Times article that talked about the possibility for more suggestion about QE tapering in this uh, Fed rate decision, which, like I said uh, this morning, is that the sell-off on that article was somewhat surprising to me because uh, the tone of it seemed to match the expectations that were already in the market. You know, they don't expect tapering to happen this meeting, but potentially in September. Uh, so, you know, perhaps that article simply weighed down the market. The market yesterday wanted to break out of that wedge. Uh, and today, with that weight lifted, no more major headlines spooking traders and investors, uh, the S&P was able to break higher out of that wedge pattern. Uh, and talking about a few individual names that we talked about this morning, the theme that I focused on was that uh, tech stocks could see money rotate in on a continuing basis due to the fact that interest rates are rising and money could flow out of safer, more dividend type stocks uh, into higher risk assets like, like tech stocks. Uh, and, and as a result of that, we well, basically we talked about how current charts in the market were a reflection potentially of that trend because we don't you know, we judge trends based on the charts. We look at what sectors are setting up bullish chart patterns, we look at what sectors are broken, and we use that to formulate our themes. And that theme developed for me, uh, not just because of my knowledge about rising interest rates and, and what it does to various asset groups, but because all the charts that we had been seeing that had the most bullish setups were in tech. And so a couple that we looked at today, I'll take a look at a couple charts now. Uh, Google is one that we talked about and I talked about on, uh, about you know, being, being willing to buy pretty much any dip in this stock because of what they're doing with their core search business in addition to all their Project X lab projects like uh, Google Loon and Google Glass and all that stuff that really is, is exciting investors. I, I know it's not having a major impact on the bottom line right now or any impact on the bottom line, but there's so many compelling aspects to being invested in Google. And today uh, you saw buyers come in and push it back above this pivot uh, back above the $900 area, and I think it's a matter of time, and it's a short matter of time before you see it back at all-time highs above this 920 area, and just a matter of time before you see it above 1,000. So uh, Google's one that on any dip in the market, uh, I would look to get involved long-term, and you could even catch nice short-term trades on it uh, if that's your game also. Amazon is another one that we talked about. It's been showing great market leadership. From a long-term perspective, it's, got, it's on a little shakier ground than Google because uh, Amazon really doesn't make much money or any money yet, but they do invest a lot in technology and, and new technologies that could really bear fruit in the future. I'll talk about their relationship with GE that was announced today a little bit later once I get into that story about GE, but uh, Amazon today was very strong. A nice move back up to this pivot. Like I said, it broke out and it was a little bit discouraging to see the retest of that trend line from this descending wedge or descending channel that we talked about in Amazon but a nice retest is healthy and now it's back above that pivot and now it uh, looks like it's going to challenge this uh, pivot 52 week highs around the 284 285 area so Amazon definitely want to keep an eye on and for now one to, to keep buying dips on it's, along with Google it seems to emerge have emerged as the tech leader so a couple other names to look at Cisco, Hewlett Packard are ones that we talked about. I really love stocks. We really love stocks in our courses that gap up, hold the gap, and build a new base. With Cisco, you saw that uh, on this earnings report. It gapped up, had a retest of the eight day, but built a nice base. And today, didn't have a ton of power, but 
and it had another tail, which is not what you like to see, but I think this will still continue to go higher. Uh, once the market is able to get a little bit more of a bid, perhaps if the news about the Fed is uh, you know, bullish the way perhaps the market is anticipating right now, uh, I think Cisco could be one that goes. Hewlett Packard, same situation. It was actually a little bit better today, less of a tail above its eight-day moving average, you know, obviously above all the other moving averages as well. Those trades look to be in motion. Uh, you take a look at a stock like Netflix. You know, we had been stalking that descending channel, that uh, downtrend in Netflix for a potential entry. They took that away from us with the gap up, but now we're, we're looking for some sort of consolidation, some sort of base to form uh, for another potential trade in Netflix. And with today's relative weakness and slight sell-off uh, from the gap up, we have nice levels to, to gauge short-term composure now. And if it's able to break back above today's high, it could provide a nice actionable trade for you. But it'd be even better if it forms a multi-day or even a multi-week base around this area to, to work off some of that overbought condition that's a result of yesterday's gap and potentially set up for, for traders to enter again. Go down the list here, S&DK, another one really strong today from the morning call. It was one that we talked about, less of a pattern after yesterday's breakout, but when you see a really strong igniting bar like that, it usually, in my opinion, leads to more upside. And that's what you saw with SanDisk today. Really nice. It was undaunted by that market sell-off in the afternoon yesterday, whereas some other tech stocks uh, had tails and closed off their highs. But SanDisk had a smaller tail, didn't close as far off its highs, and today followed through really nicely above that $63 area. We zoom out to a macro chart of SanDisk. A really nice move, obviously, on a macro basis from 2008, 2009, from below the $10 level, and even more recently uh, from 2012, it's, it's doubled from around the $30 price area. Uh, the next major spot after it's cleared this resistance, you know, is this cluster up here around the $65, $70 area. So it looks like SanDisk has some room and, and has a bullish story on that stock. A few of the quick hitters we talked about, uh, the two Musk stocks. I talked about the potential for, not TSA, TSLA. I talked about the potential for a further squeeze in Tesla, as Elon Musk is always coming out with new announcements and everything like that. There were reports today that General Motors is going to use some of Tesla's technology. That's what really triggered the late day uh, afternoon squeeze in Tesla. And, you know, news like that, it, it gets short scrambling and potentially lead to a bigger move. So I watched that pivot from yesterday's high that's around 104.75. Above that, you could get another actionable trade. SCTY. I talked about how the IPO lockup expiration was last week, and the stock didn't really sell off sharply the way some people anticipated, so now I think it could be ripe for a squeeze. I'll go ahead and take a look at the short-term price action this morning. It was a lot more promising uh, than it closed, but as you can see, I'll go to the East Coast time frame, so you can see only the intraday action. This morning, on a 13-minute chart, we had a monster move in the morning. It looked like it was getting ready to squeeze. I was very happy that my call had, had played out well, but the stock tailed off the rest of the day. I still think uh, it could squeeze, but you know, obviously that close is not what you want to see. So I take some caution with Solar City. It's one that I think is more conducive to short-term trading than uh, long-term guys. I think there's still a lot of questions facing the solar industry and Solar City. Uh, financially, they haven't really arrived yet, but the story is compelling. So. I continue to keep an eye on the stock. MGM, we talked about a downtrend in that stock. If we go back to the daily, zoom out a little bit. A similar type pattern, not quite as steep of a downtrend as you saw on Netflix, but a similar type setup, where if we get a break of this downtrend line, which we started to, to creep above today, we could get some more momentum in MGM. This one's not quite in motion yet. Uh, didn't show a ton of power today, but one to keep an eye on. And the XHB, continuing to provide really nice fuel for this market. It was one of the weaker sectors, highly oversold. It was able to snap back, but looked like it might get rejected at the eight day and, and make another low, but instead it made a higher low and since has bounced really impressively to, like I said, add more fuel to this market uh, ahead of this Fed meeting. A really nice follow through today after yesterday's big housing number. Continue to watch to see if we get more upside in XHB. Gold, I talked about a negative thesis on gold is that, and it's something I talked about on Twitter a little bit today is that Gold and uh, equity markets have sometimes traded in concert, sometimes traded uh, inverse to each other. When the Fed has been easing and asset prices have been going up and inflation expectations have been high, it's bullish for both equities and gold. But now, uh, and sometimes gold is a safe haven trade, is that 
you know, when markets are in turmoil, people are looking for gold as a safe haven for uh, you know, rainy days and things like that. But now what you're seeing is that the price driver for equities and gold, which has been uh, central bank activity, is looking like it might dry up a little bit with QE tapering and potentially higher rates in the future. Uh, so you're seeing both equities, well, equities are actually performing really well uh, in response to possibly a growing economy and some nice economic reports, but that lack of, or you know, the, the potential lack of such a great driver from the Federal Reserve is weighing really heavily on gold. Uh, and and uh, the stock market is driven by several factors, including you know, economic growth, earnings, things like that, but gold is pure speculation. The only thing that drives the prices in gold uh, is speculation, is inflation expectations. And right now, expectations for in inflation are very low due to the Fed's uh, potentially pulling out of QE, and that's weighing a lot on gold. And I, you see this, uh, going back to the chart, you see this support area around the 130 $131 area as an area that's going to be a huge place for the GLD to take a stand because if you do get a break of that level, we zoom out and it's, it's look out below for GLD. We'll go even out to the monthly chart to take a look at it. You know, you don't really have much of a support area once you get past this little cluster. I mean, there's really not much of a major support level for GLD. And I continue to think that uh, gold will see more downside as the Fed uh, moves in the direction of exiting QE rather than additional QE. And you even have guys like Jim Rogers, who's a, a notorious gold uh, commentator, gold bug, talking about how the correction in gold is not over, but his very macro thesis remains intact. You know, after a, a decade-long, 12-year-long bull run for gold, it's natural to see a little bit of corrective action. That's what he's saying. So, you know, we'll watch some levels once gold pulls back a little bit more and, and see how it reacts. But to me, all the moving averages are curling down. You know, the eight-month, 21-month, 8 and 21 period on a monthly chart and it's below its 50 month moving average so a lot of really bearish looking things for gold right now and the the story is bearish for gold as, as the Fed looks to exit QE. Hope it did a decent job explaining that dynamic. I was stumbling over my thoughts a little bit there but hopefully it came out right. The last thing I want to talk about is General Electric. Uh, today if you go to, we'll take a quick look at the chart and then I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that story. GE huge move today after I would announced a new initiative uh, that I'll get into in a little bit, but you saw a nice pattern, a nice pivot that GE broke above today. I think it could see more downside because I think today's news is really significant. But uh, what they announced was a software platform called Predictivity, which is in partnership with Accenture and Pivotal. Uh, Pivotal is a company that's a spinoff of EMC and um, was it, EMC and and VMware. Uh, the guy who runs it is a guy named Paul Meritz. He's a former executive of Microsoft and VMware. Uh, he's a, a very well-regarded guy. And, and what GE has done is build this software platform that's going to be really hev heavy on advanced analytics in order to reduce waste uh, and create uh, higher efficiency in some of their energy products. And that industry in general, the industrial internet industry, is expected to see huge growth in the next decade or so. Uh, to the point that one study done by uh, Wikibon estimates that spending on industrial internet uh, aspects of a business could reach over 500 billion by 2020. And what in the industrial internet is, it's, it's a, a set of chips and things that are embedded into equipment, whether it be energy equipment or something else. I read a, an interesting article uh, today, if you follow my Twitter, about the internet of things, which is similar to the industrial internet, is that there's going to be chips in the future. A simple example is a one that's embedded into your alarm clock so that once you hit your alarm clock and you stop snoozing, uh, your coffee machine is automatically receives a signal from your alarm clock that says brew a pot of coffee. Uh, and it's a, it's a simple sounding technology based on if-then statements, which is uh, the foundation of programming language. But the ability to build you know, a, a different type of internet, it's going to be a huge thing for companies. It's a trend to watch. Uh, companies that are involved with this and GE is one of the first ones to make a huge announcement about it uh, could really revolutionize their industry and, and be a huge boon for that stock and that company. And the, the relation to Amazon that I talked about earlier is that with all these analytics and all the data they're going to have to analyze they need a heavy, uh, they need a large amount of cloud storage infrastructure to to house all that data and to run all that data and they've partnered with Amazon Web Services to do that 
And the Amazon Web Services service and their cloud storage unit is one of the big growth drivers for them and why, despite the fact they don't make any money yet, uh, people are really bullish on the story of Amazon uh, is that cloud storage aspect of their business and why a lot of cloud storage stocks have been really strong in the market over the last several years is people are anticipating these types of uh, large-scale projects that are going to require a ton of uh, storage space. But that's a little bit of a story there to talk about why GE went up. I know traders sometimes they just look at the charts and look at the symbols, but I think it's important to understand a little bit of the details about why stocks move and, and what's driving price action in certain stocks. And with GE, I think the price action tells you this is a very bullish development, and the story is also very bullish in my mind. And I think GE has, GE has considerably more upside from here. But that's enough of that. Uh, we'll have Scott back here from the morning call and daily recap and everything tomorrow. Uh, but thanks for tuning in to me today, and, and we'll see you out in the virtual trading floor and on Twitter. I'm Evan Lazarus, Chief Knowledge Officer for T3Live.com. You don't become a great trader by watching videos and taking courses. You become a great trader through live screen time. Accelerate that learning curve by tapping into the experience of seasoned professionals. Currently, we're offering five-day free trials to each of our four mentoring rooms. In the mentoring rooms, we teach our strategies in the context of the live market. To sign up for a free trial, go to the T3Live education page, fill out the form, and get started when the next trading session begins. We hope to see you in one of our mentoring rooms.